we talk about endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands are glands that dump their substance or their product directly into the bloodstream. An, an exocrine gland is a gland that has a duct that will dump the material into a duct work and then into the system after that. So this chapter we're going to talk about the endocrine glands. Now this is really kind of a, an interesting system because it's all correlated together. Each hormone affects another hormone. They're all interrelated in some way. In order for this system to work we have to have certain cells that accept these chemicals. Very few of the hormones are, affect all the cells of the body. These glands will produce hormones and they are Hormones that are produced are pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenal, and the pineal gland. Those are the ones that we'll talk about. We have uh, hormones are produced in the, also in the brain, the heart, and the small intestine. So we're producing these hormones all over the place. Now the one thing about hormones is that uh, one hormone will be produced by a cell, and then in turn that hormone will stimulate the, sti the production of another hormone. So they're all interrelated in this way. So if one isn't working properly, the others will falter and not work very well. Now we correlate this endocrine system and the hormones with the nervous system. When we are nervous, when we're excited, the hormones are also being kicked in. The, the epinephrine, norepinephrine are being stimulated so that we get this situation in, in, in place and it becomes more ex accentuated because of this hormones. Hormones are slower acting than the nervous system but they are very powerful. For instance if you're scared you go to a scary movie when you're sitting in the theater and the first time something jumps out the nervous system kicks in and you jump. You're scared. Your high blood, your blood pressure goes up, your pulse rate goes up, your breathing starts getting better, faster, you're going into that fight or flight mechanism. You want to get out of there. You're scared, but you just still you want to stay there, right? Well, as that takes off, pretty soon the the hormonal system kicks in, the adrenals kick in, and you have this very excited uh, continuation going on. Another example is like if you're going to get pulled over by a policeman. You look in your rearview mirror. Boom! You see those lights going and the siren. You start breathing fast, you get really nervous, but all the while you're, the, the policeman is there, he might be very nice, or they might be very nice, you get your whatever information, and then even after they leave, you're still sweaty, you're nervous, your blood pressure's up for like 20 minutes. That's the, the hormones coursing through your body, keeping you excited and nervous about things. So endocrine and exocrine glands. Ducted and unducted glands. That's the big thing about these glands is they don't have ducts. They go directly into the bloodstream. The exocrine glands are more for like food digestion and uh, like a lipase and uh, chymotrypsin and trypsin that you'll find in the digestive system next semester. Now, we have two. We have a lot of different places that we create these hormones. Um, one of the areas that we look at is the hypothalamus. This has both nerve and endocrine parts to it. Other tissues that produce hormones are the adipose cells, which is kind of interesting because the adipose cells themselves produce a hormone that makes us so we're not so hungry. So if we're filling up our adipose cells or we're eating too much, if the adipose cells are working properly, it's supposed to tell us to stop eating, but it's not. Something's blocking that impulse. The thymus that's in your, in your chest, the small intestine, stomach, kidneys, and heart. We'll talk about those as we go through each one of those uh, organs. Now these are the hormones in the human body. These are all of them. Um, we'll, we're going to go through most of these as we go through this or as I go through these materials so that you understand where they work and how they work because they'll coordinate lots of parts of it. These are where they're produced. This is the only places in the body that they're really produced. Up in the brain, the throat, the chest, kidneys, 
around the kidneys and the gonadal regions. Long distance carriers of of information is really what they are. They're just hormones, they're chemicals that are transferred through long distances and help us to um, elicit responses in the body. We have autocrines. These affect um, same cells and then the pancrocrines um, look, act locally and they affect cells other than those that secrete them. Okay, so some of the hormones will act upon other cells to help them stimulate better. For instance, in the thyroid, we have thyroid receiving hormones, or releasing hormones, and thyroid stimulating hormones. And then we also have the thyroxin that is produced by the, the thyroid. All these hormones are designed to elicit a response to other cells. We have two basic classes. We have amino acid ones and we have steroids. Amino acids, we have amine, thyrox, thyroxin, peptides, and proteins. These are the uh, specialized ones, but we also have the steroid ones. Now, you have to realize that steroids aren't all bad. You always hear on TV that the baseball players or football players are taking steroids. That's different than what we're talking about here. Those are man-made. Those aren't really steroids that we want to be taking for our bodies. These steroids are synthesized from cholesterol, the foods that we eat. We find them in the gonadal and the adrenal cortical regions. So um, by the adrenals and by the gonads, we're producing these steroids like testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, uh, and they are what elicits the secondary sex characteristics of humans. So what do hormones do? Well, they can do a lot of things. They can stimulate other cells to create proteins. They elicit responses from target cells. Only certain cells have receptors on them to elicit these responses. They can activate or de deactivate enzyme systems. So for instance, if we have a, a system where we're set up and we want uh, lots of enzymes to be produced so our metabolism is revved up. We can produce a hormone that will stimulate that. Um, we can also stimulate mitosis. If we need more cells to be produced, say we need going the best it can, but we need more red blood cells. We can send erythropoiesis in, and that will stimulate the production of red blood cells uh, in the bone marrow. So there's a lot of things that the hormones do that we don't even actually know that they're doing them. They're very silent, they're very long-lasting, and uh, usually not too drastic. Even when you become full of adrenaline, if you're nervous and scared, it comes on you very slowly. It's not very fast. Your nervous system is very quick, but the chemicals in the hormonal system is slow and methodical. It brings this change upon in that way. Water-soluble hormones, like on amino acids, uh, thyroxin, they can't enter the target cells. They have to be brought in. Remember, we have this phospholipid bilayer around our cells. So these water-soluble ones are repelled away from our cells. So we have to have this receptor actually grab hold of it and pull it into the system. Okay. That's one of the reasons why insulin is one of those things that we have to be careful of. The lipid-soluble hormones, like the steroid hormones, don't have any problems. They can enter the cells much easier than the water-based ones. When they go through these cells, they create a faster response because they can get in quicker. So water and oil don't mix. Water and water, uh, oil and oil do mix, and we get this response. So some of the times when we look at this, uh, hormones, steroid, steroid hormones specifically, and thyroid hormones affect lots of the cells of the body. The thyroid hormones affect almost every cell of the body that we have. They create the, the metabolism for ourselves. So if your thyroid is low, your metabolism is low. And the way this works is if, you, if you, everything is not working properly, your 
you can't produce the proteins necessary for your body to work. So when we go to, to produce, produce the messenger RNA, it doesn't work. And therefore we don't get protein synthesis produced. So we, we have to have everything in place, everything has to work properly. The receptor hormones have to pull the hormone into the cell. The cell then has to stimulate the production of, uh, of this messenger RNA that will produce the proteins. Little diagram shows this how this works. We have our, our nice little steroid hormone that comes in. Um, and in order for it to get into the nucleus, which is here, it has to go through the pores. And then it stimulates the, the production of the messenger RNA, and that, that in turn produces the new protein by transcription and translation. So and if we didn't have this hormone, if we got rid of this hormone, if it wasn't produced, this protein would no longer be produced. If it's not produced, then the body can't function properly. So everything kind of balances on itself. One thing leads to another. A cascading effect usually on these systems. That's where these target cells come in. When we have a target cell on the outside of a, a, a target on the outside of a cell, we have these little receptors, and they are only responsible for that hormone. If a cell doesn't have those receptors, the hormone floats right past it. If the receptors are there, then they become in contact with them, and then we can elicit response in that cell, whether it's to produce another hormone or produce another protein, depends on what we're going to do. So, for instance, the thyroxin receptors are found on nearly every cell of the body. The adrenal ACTH receptors are only found on certain cells of the adrenal cortex. That's adrenal cortical stimulating hormone. That's the ones that stimulate the adrenals to produce their chemicals. So we have specific hormones that only elicit response on specific cells. And then in, those in turn will produce something very specific that needs to be done by the body. So we have three factors that, that help to activate these cells. How much of the hormone is actually present in the body? How much adrenaline epinephrine, thyroxine is actually in the bloodstream because these hormones are being dumped right from the cells into the bloodstream and they course throughout their body and they're looking for these cells that, to pick them up. Once they come in contact with these target cells, they can elicit their responses. But if there's no hormone in the bloodstream, nothing works. For instance, if in, in later on in life when females start to produce less and less estrogen and progesterone, it, those hormones stop being produced, then it also stops the menstrual cycle. And they start losing their menses. So with deficiencies in hormones, the body doesn't function to the capacity that it should. Also, we look at the number of receptors on the target cells. How many receptors are, is picking up these chemical signals? And what are they going to do with them once they get them? Are they going to be able to accept this? Or is there going to be enough affinity for that? <clears throat> A good example of this is insulin. Um, some people don't have the ability to use insulin. They, have, they don't have enough insulin in their system or they are insulin intolerant or their, their cells are no longer using the insulin efficiently to get the glucose into their system. And that becomes a problem for them. No glucose into the cells, no ATP, no ATP, no work. So there is a very big correlation between the amount of insulin that's in the bloodstream and how much sugar you can get into your cells. That's why people have to take shots of insulin to get that sugar into the cells. Now we can use hormones for upregulation. The uh, target cells uh, form more receptors in response to the hormones, or we can deregulate. The target cells lose receptors because of the lack of hormones. We want to, we have to keep a balance, a homeostasis in the system. So if the hormone is in this 
in place, it's coursing through the system, the cells have to pick it up if there's receptors on them. If there's no receptors, it just floats right on by. Now, if there's too much of the, the hormone, we don't want to pick up too much of it, so we're going to shut down some of the receptors so that we don't get too much of that hormone in the cell at one time. So we can either open them up or we can shut things down. Now, the one thing about these hormones, since they're coursing through our bloodstream, is that they have to be removed at some point. It's not like the nervous system where we get this action, action potential and zap, and then it stops. These hormones are there. They're still there. It's just like if, if you see somebody that's been out drinking the night before, they get really drunk. The next morning, they're still drunk because they have alcohol still coursing through their system. And in order for them to get sober again, that alcohol has to go through their kidneys and through their liver and to be detoxified. Well, that's the same way with these hormones. As the hormones course through the system, if we don't get that pulled out of the body, it's going to stay there and it's going to continue its action. So, for instance, if we, have, if we get really scared, we have this adrenaline in the system, and it will stay there for 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and then it starts to be pulled out of the system by the liver, and we start to calm down again. So we get really nervous for about 30 minutes, and then we start to relax afterwards. And then we get back to normal. And then if we get scared again, it comes back up again, and then it comes back down again. We have to keep it in that level that we can tolerate. If you're constantly being stimulated by uh, stress, then the epinephrine and norepinephrine are uh, elevated, and you're going to have high blood pressure and high heart rate and increased breathing and all those things that the epinephrine does for you. So the kidneys, the liver, all affect this release. It takes it out of the bloodstream. Now it takes it out in, in basically half-lives, half of it at a time. So after 20 minutes you get 50%, then another 50%, and another 50% until it's gone. It starts pulling it out uh, in that manner. So time will remove them av as we get going. Now, hormones work in, in several different ways. We have permissiveness. Uh, one hormone cannot exert its effect without another hormone. They kind of work together like a synergist. So we have uh, estrogen and progesterone. They work together um, in manipulation of the uh, menstrual cycle. If they are uh, one hormone produces the same effects on the target cell, they are synergistic. So we have permissiveness. You have to have the two hormones together. The synergists, these are hormones that can actually uh, cause an effect in kind of the same manner, but they're two different hormones. And then we have antagonistic hormones that combat the, the action of another hormone. So it's kind of a, a negating factor. One hormone will offset the other hormone or keep it in balance so that we don't get too far out of control. If we had hormones as we're dumping lots of this adrenaline in the system and we don't have anything to calm that down or to negate that, our body's going to stay very excited for long periods of time. So we need some type of an antagonist to get that back to normal levels. Now, back in the beginning we talked about negative and positive feedback mechanisms. Our positive feedback mechanisms are important, but more important in our system is the negative feedbacks. The negative feedback systems are found in almost all these hormones. But the only one that we really want to remember about the positive one is the oxytocin is one of them. We'll talk about some others in a little bit. But um, let's talk about negative ones first. These are hormones that keep us in balance. They go up and they go down in relationship. So we produce these hormones, they, they release into the system, they go up slowly with their response, and then when they get to the top of the response, what they need to do, they'll start to dwindle back down, they'll be taken out, and then they'll go back up if we need them again. So it's a constant seesaw battle of these hormones. We have humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, and 
hormonal stimuli of these hormones. Okay, so feedback mechanisms. Uh, calcium levels in the blood. We all need the calcium. How much calcium do we need for our, our bodies every day? What should you take? What's the normal intake of calcium that you should get? Thousand to fifteen hundred milligrams. That's what you need. As you get older, they can increase that also. But we need to have this in the system. Why do we need calcium in our bloodstream? Let's go back to the bones. Why do we need calcium in our bloodstream? Bone production. Bone production. Yep. If we don't have calcium in our bloodstream, our <clears throat> our muscles falter. Our muscles can't work and we get cramps. So one of the important muscles we have is the heart. So if we don't have calcium in our bloodstream to give to the heart, the body's going to take the calcium out of our bones to make sure that the heart functions properly. Because if the heart doesn't function properly, we die. So we're going to do everything we can to keep that heart beating. And, and it needs calcium for the contractions. So we're going to use PTH, which is parathyroid hormone, to take the calcium out of the bones and put it back in the bloodstream if we don't get it in our diet. So we get it two ways. You either eat it, we get it in our diet, or we take it out of our bones. There's no other way we can do that. Now in times where we have lots and lots of calcium in our bones, in our bloodstream, we'll put it back into our bones, hopefully, and we don't, it doesn't affect us too much. But we have to maintain that that balance so that our heart and our other, other muscles work properly. Another one is, um, we'll talk about nervous system provides stimulation to the endocrine glands. Well, when we, we get stimulated or st stressed, the hypothalamus and the sympathetic nervous system work together. The hypothalamus has a, a nervous component and it also has a hormonal component. So when we get stressed and, and scared, our bodies will increase the amount of sugar that we need for our system. So it's going to dump sugar into our bloodstream so that we can run faster and think quicker and, and get away from whatever we're scared of. So between the hypothalamus and the, nervous, the sympathetic nervous system, we accomplish this by chemical and by nervous impulses. So we're going to increase the glucose levels so that we can increase our ATP production and we can run faster and survive. Now we call this action where we're taking these hormones and eliciting responses in different areas, we call these hormonal stimuli or loops. One hormone is produced, it goes into the system, it loops around, and it will stimulate another hormonal system. So, for instance, we have uh, the anterior pituitary stimulates the target cells in another organ. That organ will produce a hormone that goes back to the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, and it shuts down that production. So it's creating a loop where we produce one chemical that goes into the body, it stimulates the body to produce another chemical to go back to that previous production area and shut it down. Otherwise, our bodies have a tendency to keep producing a substance and, and keep going, going, going if we don't have something to shut it down. We have these mechanisms that tell us how much chemical we have in our bloodstream so that we can manipulate those numbers or that amount. We don't want too much of it, we just want enough. So we're constantly fluctuating up and down with those substances. Now our pituitary gland is the master gland of the body. Years ago my kids used to live on a, we lived on a little place up here on Magnolia Avenue and my kids used to go to the bus stop. Well there were some kids just down the street and they would come to the same bus stop. And this little girl was very energetic. She's very thin, nice little girl, always jumping and playing and rough housing, very thin. About five or six years later, her mother came into my office and, and the little girl came with her and I, 
I didn't even recognize this little girl. She was short, very heavy, chunky. Her face was round. She had a she had a beard coming on the side of her cheeks, right? She was looking completely different. I said, what's wrong? Well, the mother said, well, we took her to the doctor, and the doctor said, she's all right. She's going to have, uh, just put her on some salad. She's right next to a growth spurt, and she'll be fine. I said, no, something's wrong. She's just not right. So I said, you take her back to the doctor and have him refer her to Iowa City. So they went back to the doctor, and they said, no, she's okay. It's not a problem. She'll, she'll grow out of this. She'll get thin again. Well, they brought her back in again to me, and I said, no, you have to take her to Iowa City. There's something wrong here. She's got problems. Um, I, did, I, I did, did not diagnose what she had because I wasn't for sure, but I made an appointment with them at Iowa City to an endocrinologist that went in, and she had a pituitary tumor. And if she wouldn't have had that tumor removed, it would have killed her. She would have quit using her, her proper nutrients, and she would have died. So she was getting Cushing's disease is what it was. They went in, went through her nose, took out the tumor, went up in through the ethmoid into the, basically, the, where is this, the cella tersica? Remember that? They go to the cella tersica, and they remove that tumor through her nose. They put her on medication for about a year, and she's fine now. She has a, a child. She's living a healthy life. But uh, the doctor just assumed that she was a fat little kid. She did, they didn't know her beforehand. So sometimes you have to look at people and, and question, even though that you don't know them. You know, they always been this way, or is this something new? You know, there are some conflicts that you might need to go through. Okay, so um, the rest of this I will put on YouTube, and you'll be able to access this. I'll try to keep the questions minimal on this, and we'll review it next semester. So keep that in mind. All right, we'll see you on Friday at 8 o'clock.